Hi everyone, welcome to uh, today's uh, online artist talk as part of our exhibition Home Being Long Contemporary Ireland here at the Klutzman. Uh, my name is Chris Clark, I'm Senior Curator at the Klutzman and Co-Curator of uh, Home. Um, and very pleased today to welcome artist James L. Hayes to talk about his work and to take part in a moderated discussion and Q&A. Uh, James L. Hayes is an Irish contemporary visual artist whose current work and research practice reinvests a modernist sculptural language. His recent projects use methods of artistic production as a means by which to interrogate the boundaries between artist, artisan and art object in order to draw out the often incongruous relationships between finished art, object, art objects and the industrial aspects of the processes that produce these revered objects. He has been awarded numerous awards and grants to support his practice and he also invests heavily in the university educational sector and work across the UK and US higher education system frequently taking part in visiting lecturing series and international cross-collegial projects and events. Uh, James is a graduate of Limerick School of Art and Design, uh, De Montfort University Leicester and University of London, and he's principal lecturer in sculpture at the Crawford College of Art here in Cork, Ireland. Um, as part of the format for the day, for those of you who haven't attended in the past, um, we'll be presenting a pre-recorded uh, presentation uh, by James on his work for the next uh, 30 minutes roughly. And then we'll link back up here live for discussion and Q&A. So you can pose questions as well uh, using the chat function or the Q&A function. I'll be keeping an eye on both. Uh, and please keep in mind that these talks and conversations will be available to the view on the Glucksman YouTube channel afterwards. Uh, so I'm very pleased to uh, welcome and to hand over to James L. Hayes. Thank you very much. And um, thank you to Chris and Fiona for inviting me along today to speak um, on the series. I'm just going to speak about some of my my past works. Uh, I'm going to speak about the works that um, were selected for the show and how they respond to the themes of the show. And also about some of my kind of future ideas and research and, and where my work is developed. I'm just going to shut off my camera now to see so you can see the entirety of my slides and we'll get back at the Q&A afterwards. My own research and practice has been really underpinned uh, by a kind of seminal period in my work or in my time as an artist. I worked in the UK from the kind of late 90s to the mid 2000s where I worked for a renowned fine art foundry called AB Fine Art, which is still in the East End of London. Uh, and they're responsible for casting many of the world's UK's and leading world's um, contemporary sculpture makers, including the likes of um, Barry Flanagan and Anish Kapoor and Rachel White Reed and so on. I worked there as a, a mold maker and as a metal fabricator and bronze caster and kind of um, all around kind of artisan in the making of large scale and production of large scale bronze casts. This period, I suppose, as I mentioned, had a kind of really a big effect well on my practice. And at a period later on in, in most recently in about 2015 during a residency at the Irish Museum of Modern Art, I began to kind of reflect back on that work and that time. And that has led really to the genesis of the last five or six years of my practice that has all stemmed from that in line with my own kind of in, in, um, investment or experimentation into the use of cast iron um, and making cast iron furnaces and producing cast iron artworks. Also at this time, uh, my research was also looking into kind of other aspects of materiality of sculpture. And I was also really interested in the writings of the American, um, the US American historian and art critic Rosalind Krauss and her writings on sculpture and particularly, um, you know, minimalist sculpture from the 1960s, but also her research and work into the uh, really her research focus into originality and the authenticity and authenticity this is particularly in relation to bronze casting which is something that i have experienced from my time in ab in time in regard to making uh, multiples and commodifications of, of large-scale artworks so in her book uh, the originality of the avant-garde and other myths from 1986 krauss puts forth the uh, argument that in relation to the origins of authenticity as a myth. She begins this book by discussing um, bronze casting and citing the largest ever Rodin exhibition at the National Gallery in Washington in 1986. 
here uh, the viewers of the exhibition were confronted with a brand new cast of Roland's monumental work, The Gates of Hell, from 1880 to 1917. This bronze cast was only completed a number of months before the exhibition opened in the USA in 1986, and Krauss asked how could this possibly be an original Roland sculpture, given that the artist had died 70 years previously. Uh, the issue of posthumous casting draws attention to the often uh, unseen aspect of bronze sculpture as a highly revered art object that come out of the process of multiplicity and unoriginality. Actually, it could be argued the only authentic or the original aspect of the work is perhaps the unseen mould which produces the work. And this is something that is a big feature within my practice and how I use moulds to produce large sets of multiples and um, manufacturing of, of a, a repeat or of an index over and over. My work um, uh, also investigates the, the issues of originality by exposing a lot of the kind of hidden or unseen aspects of casting processes, multiple casting processes. I see, as, as, as I seek to kind of find out how these kind of preparatory um, processes can be pushed or elevated to a, a similar status of a finished art object. My interest in hidden processes of production has always obviously been informed by my times working work in industry because I, I would have aided in the production of many multiples for of the same sculpture for many renowned artists to, to be exported to museums and galleries and art markets around the world. So I was kind of, I, I had, that was a simultaneous kind of discovery for me and it kind of enlightened me into the kind of nature of conditioning and the commodification of, of posthuman cast, casting. One of the many celebrated artists that I was working with in AB and, and went to work on it as far as a, as a personal assistant to was, was Barry Flanagan, the late Barry Flanagan. Um, and I was really interested in, in, in the fact that Barry had made the huge transformation in, in one way and, and a lot that's been debated and written about over recent times about his kind of transformation from kind of ephemeral or contemporary, um, sorry, ephemeral contemporary installation based artist in, into an artist that had had a huge kind of bronze casting production in, in multiple foundries around the world, plus other kind of other larger scales works in steel and stone and things like that. So I was very, old, I was also very interested by a work that he had made in, in 1981 called The Long Man of Wilmington. And this work really hadn't kind of kind of dawned its importance on me for a number of years until I, I kind of went to look back and study of it, study of it. And obviously, as those who could have experience in, in casting would know when they look at this slide of, of the cast in bronze, that it kind of high, it's made from the runners and risers that we call the kind of the circulatory or gating system that's built around a cast in order for it to be fulfilled or cast through the lost wax process. It also reference to the Long Man of Willington and East Sussex, which is a chalk drawing on the Sussex Downs, and but also plays kind of homage to the nature of, of that gating system. While I was on research, um, our my residency, our production residency at the Irish Museum of Modern Art in 2015, I began looking at the nature of one-off sculptures making kind of unique castings just out of the raw materials that form the basis for creating circulatory systems and, and casting setups. So I began making a series of works over and over, repeating them through some simple kind of molds that I had made on site and also using kind of bases and platforms just, just to build upon. The content was not necessarily important at the time. It was that the works were to feature the kind of processes in themselves. They were to feature things that referenced a lot of early Flanagan sculptures. There was a lot of twine, balls of twine and casts and cups. I made cup sculptures from paper cups and plastic cups where I take simple kind of wax castings from and use them to form the cup or the entry system to a possible mold. I later went on and produced some of these unique castings in bronze. These were a couple of works called the analog series, which related obviously to the nature of analog tape. One was being a, a, a small cassette tape, the other being a, a VHS videotape, which was then molded and cast, but also set up around a, a, a circulatory system, which was elaborated to create the sculptures.
I further went on then to make kind of pieces that eliminated kind of objects completely. But whilst also I kind of remade a work that I had begun when I was at AB Fine Archery in the early 2000s and I kind of completed after my residency in Emma where I repurposed two bronze casts, balls of string, which I had made over a long period of time in 2001 to 2002 where I was trying to cast the perfect ball of string from what's called a, a burnout or complete kind of uh, destruction process of an original ball of string. So these pieces made reference to Barry Flanagan's uh, late kind of 1960s and 70s rope works and twine pieces. After then in 2016 and 2017 returned to AB Fine Art in London and began looking at their former mold cellar. This is a kind of large scale repository of 19 from the 1970s to present day which stores all the molds of artworks that are produced up above in the foundry um uh, the, the upper floors of the foundry above the the kind of dickensian kind of looking mold cellar in um east end of london so this is a vast kind of cavern cellar or boneyard i described it as of lots of of molds of of different generations some which are kind of deteriorating um, due to just old age because they, they they have to be preserved and I often kind of think of the idea that if these were negatives from a um, Marcel Duchamp image or something that they would be preserved in nice kind of cooled rooms in the Pompidou Centre or something but I think it's kind of fascinating to see that this the, the storage of these things is not maybe as kind of thought as of as important or as considered as, as really um, you know seminal or is important to keep when in fact as i mentioned earlier the idea that these these are the true index of, of the original sculptures that would have been made for for the whole variety of artists that were there so that idea kind of still begins to, to kind of fascinate me in my work so later on in 20 2018 2019 i began making a series of works for a solo exhibition in dublin at, at gallery in mart and I began again looking to, to make reference to early Barry Flanagan pieces in particular these make reference to a number of his kind of blanket and twig pieces and I was trying to kind of subvert the notions of, of these works by using or change well changing or subverting the material use I was using these um, packing blankets that we used at times to pack artworks for travel and transportation these kind of woolly immense kind of thick strong blankets to kind of create artworks i also instead of using real kind of twigs and actual objects i began casting in acrylic resin large scale twigs so they were kind of advantageous or really kind of challenging castings to make in one pieces and to stand and then behind the work the hole in this work titled the hole in the tree the hole makes reference to a seminal kind of video film work by barry fan called the hole in the sea and behind, behind the, the hole in my work here, I have cast a section of tree or uh, tree bark in, in cast iron and, and, and painted it with, with gold leaf, just to kind of reference again, the kind of non precious or democratic use of the iron opposed to using the bronze as in contemporary practice. A partner work to this piece, The Hole in the Tree, was July 19, which was another blanket piece that I had constructed for the exhibition, which was adjacent to the former work there, and also made reference to a piece that Barry Flanagan had made in July 1969, using the same kind of compositional format, which was to reference that work. More recently, I've been looking at a lot of classical um, artists, in particular, um, Mandaro Rosso. He was a really interesting artist that was a contemporary of uh, Rodin's and was revered by, by many, many, art, uh, many artists later on, and um, particularly the, the Futurist movements um, and Umberto Boccioni um, uh, was really in, in interested and intrigued by the type of work that Mandaro made. Um, Unfortunately, Rosso's never he kind of matched the reputation of, of artists like Rodin. He, he, he came about at a time when 
I suppose that Roland was 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 the the this the central person to to take on that this type of work. His last sculpture um, called Eke Eke Pure, which is this work here, which I saw in the um, National Sculpture Centre of Dallas recently. Um, was produced in 1906 in London, where the artist had a had a one man show and was con con commissioned by to make a portrait of Alfred Wilfred Mond. Um, uh, about, uh, he was a small British boy, about five or six years old. Um, Russell, you know, was actually known to have a or to be called to have a kind of impressionist style as a sculpture, because of the kind of the light or kind of airy um, de dematerialized forms into his sculpture. He like a kind of an impressionist painter. He would almost paint. Uh, um, he would paint a lot of the wax surfaces onto um, plaster casts that he he had he had taken from pieces or, or portraits that he had modelled. So he he would work through a kind of a, an unfinished kind of series and, and make it a kind of a transitory piece, opposed opposed to having it from a fixed vantage point from a mould. He he would kind of manipulate. The molds over and over, or the, sorry, the casts over and over, and paint them in in, in wax so that they would have really kind of um, delicate or very kind of pure pure quality, and that again that we weren't um, they weren't being able to be reproduced over and over. They were they were essentially one softs after he'd manipulated them, and these are obviously incredibly sought after pieces right now. This one, the sick child from eighteen ninety eight. Uh, was a was what was known as a, a plaster cast investment for wax for bronze casting. So, a lot of the time, I think Russell must have been unable to get a lot of his work in in bronze for for cost purposes, obviously like us all. <laughs> um, but this so but this work now has been kind of really considered or looked back at, at the the material the material quality of, of this work and and how interesting this this is you know not for now to be considered in a material sense. So the, that that um, led me to make uh, a, a series of works, kind of um, in response to some of these works I'd seen by Russell. But I just wanted to show this um, interesting portrait that Russell took of himself in his studio in eighteen eighty nine. Um, Russell remained in Paris till kind of really the end of his life, but he he kind of struck up lots of friendships with you know really interesting writers like um, Zola, and um, he kind of he hung out with kind of artists and, and form friendships with um, people like even Rodin as well but I, th I think they had a kind of a falling out over some um, issues but um, Russell kind of maintained his studio in Paris where he had his own foundry and uh, he, he kind of tried to manipulate the moulds in, in for, for ways of doing it himself and finding shortcuts to be able to, to afford him to be able to make the work and the opportunity also then to kind of manipulate the waxes in ortho unorthodox kind of ways um, you know, and have you know a lot of the time that those errors that he was looking for would be regarded as casting errors and would be sent back by foundries or recast again. But he he kind of elected not to clean away that work. He he elected to celebrate it. So that that's something that kind of really resonated with me. You know, um, he also kind of did the same kind of thing with photographs and negatives at the kind of early age of that kind of photographic age, he was starting to manipulate negatives and plates and things like that as well. So he was kind of always kind of avant-garde in his sense of kind of trying to kind of change that thing. So that that has kind of struck you with me as uh, along with the sense of the materiality of sculpture, you know, it was his, it was his, it was his sense of practice to kind of subord subordinate or the impression or, or to kind of manipulate that impression opposed to it being kind of clean out of the mold. So a series of works that I wanted to speak about was a series of works I made between 2018, 2019 and 20 was the Scapegoat series, um, which is a series of sculptures that relate to the idea or myth of the scapegoat. Um, and I originally was look, began to kind of look at um, not only kind of kind of read this, the, the kind of the narratives of, of the myth, but I was also looked at this kind of renowned paintings by William Holman Hunt of the scapegoat, uh, which was described in the book of Levic Leviticus, I can never say that. Um, and it describes that on the day of atonement, a goat would have been his horns wrapped in red cloth uh, and representing the sins of this community would be driven out of the city. And a lot of times I was, I was looking at the, the different kind of retellings of the myths and the, just a lot of the Jewish retellings of it, but 
when it describes as two 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 scapegoats being fattened up by the city and one being sacrificed within the city and the other being sent off and to, for it to take away the sins of the city and for it to never to be fed or took after or looked after or anything like that so i don't know kind of which of the faith is maybe worse but i was i'm kind of interested in in, in that idea of this moving uh, you know way and, and take taking this and being loaded with this kind of level of sin or debt so i actually be, be you know bearing in mind i was making these kind of the ideas of the kind of one-off sculpture and these kind of sculptures that i would manipulate i was and making these kind of really small unique kind of wire uh wire sculptures that would be painted painted with wax and then wrapped intensely with um um runners and risers or shop bought runners and risers I, I was making this while on a residency in the university of minnesota in the united states in 2019 and i was really these this were a kind of they were there was like like russell there was no kind of drawings made for these sculptures they were kind of they were very much instinctive they were very, very much about you know wrapping around and they were at different points as you can see in the images as going through the kind of wax making a shelling up a running up process they they became to take on more characters and i didn't really mind what was left on or what stayed behind this would all kind of come out as i went through process this was them just being initially cast in iron and then i had a further idea in which to kind of make them even more kind of nasty in a way which was that i wanted to kind of galvanize the work i wanted to dip them within sink and, and make them to become really kind of embittered and as each way they went through another uh, process they became to either bits used to fall off or <laughs> little things that i would leave on i i would consider I mean, and I love this idea that that, that you know that that the galvanizing process is is a is a process of coating things as mentioned in in molten zinc, but it's a it's a it's an alchemic process that is to um, immerse or, uh, immerse an object or to give it a level of protection or to form a body or a crust or protection around you know, and it's it's like it's it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a historical scientific kind of link to to the work. It also kind of makes this um connection to that notion of the word galvanized to kind of to kind of come together with a thought or an idea so the objects the, the objects were kind of formed in this in this presentation there was six of them together and i mounted them on on pieces of, of packing foam and i built these plinths out of packing ply or shutter ply as, as we call it it's for you know it's for the building industry so again i'm trying to kind of look at the notions of the different material qualities of each thing in relation to i don't know packing or protection or some kind of uh deliberation to the notion of of care or wrapping or aban abandonment also it's the type of material that gets abandoned from mm. production within construction and within whatever art making whichever way you describe it so the series were very kind of a, very very delicate although they were extremely kind of brutal in their production and are solid cast iron a lot of them are actually quite they actually can't weigh an awful lot i remember even trying to remove them back from the us you know uh, these these cat big lumps of cast iron were, were causing kind of issues So the work that I submitted for the home show, I just want to talk about that for uh, the final section of my talk. Um, um, obviously, I presented two um, interconnected works which respond to a number of the themes which were outlined in Michael D. Higgins' address to the UN General Assembly on the 25th of September 2019. Um, the first work I, I, I submitted was a large-scale wall-based sculpture titled In Search of Authenticity. Uh, no good, no good deed goes unpunished, and this refers to a line in the Michael D. Higgins um, address, which speaks of seeking that of authenticity as the citizens, both young and old, seeking verbal, physical, and authentic actions in response to climate change or climate crisis. The proposed work um, would consist of about one hundred cast plaster painting canvases, um, and I wanted to present these pure white casts hung in the grid. Uh, on format, uh, formatted on a, on, a, on a darkened 
a darkened wall, a darkened wall, which was like a green, a very much of kind of landscapey, Irishy green um, background, which was a kind of to make the the white canvases stand out like a ghost or a kind of an echo of their former kind of original self. So this canvas was um, originally belonged to my father, um, my late father, which was a depiction of his kind of native homeland of West Waterford. And it was a kind of depiction of the of a, a kind of classical uh, Irish landscape scene, which was in this case was uh, uh, the Cumber, Cumber Mountains of, of West Waterford. So the kind of idea was that uh, it was kind of exemplifying that kind of notion of nostalgia. My father was one of the many Irish people that, that went to live in, in the UK from the kind of uh, late 1940s, 1950s uh, and, and later kind of returned in, in the 1970s to, to bring up his, his family and stuff like that. So it's like the, the my idea for the work was to kind of repetitively cast uh, the, the 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 painting over and over um you know to kind of challenge the notion of of the idea i suppose of the art object um and that the kind of notion of a pictorial display by display so by by creating a kind of a larger artwork from from the in in essence the mechanical supports of, of a painting it was its aim to kind of make a new work of art or, or in a, such a kind of a, I suppose, turn, a turning a back, you know, a looking back or turning back on the classical view or to of the surface of the painting and to subvert that kind of notion. So resisting the urge to, to turn the painting around, you know, according to the kind of the narrative that we're all kind of used to, to looking at. So to present a theme or, or another narrative or are looking at an appearance that's you know looking at the supports and the supports of things and looking at you know what we is almost a kind of a metaphor for me or the kind of a, a notion that how we i suppose are so aware of climate change and or the climate emergency and, and how we're, we we kind of mostly live in den denial all of us all, all the time and i think we're really seeing that at the moment you know so that dark and green background kind of, you know, aims to kind of present that stereotypical green or, or, or the green of nostalgia or that kind of green of Ireland or whatever you want to kind of describe. As so the work kind of aims to kind of, you know, stand stand out on, on that basis. The second work I submitted was um, a standalone which I made back in 2017 and um, which I had uh, kind of my own kind of fascination with the vegetable asparagus which many of you maybe who know me may have joined in on that um, one of the things I think about it a lot is that it's such a under cultivated uh, vegetable within Ireland which is a kind of very bizarre thing given that our climate is very much suited to it even though that it's very seasonal so I suppose of many many of you are aware that you know a lot of the, the most are 90 percent of these berries that we buy in to eat is imported from uh, mainly South America and is the most air mild vegetable on the planet and which is obviously so damaging and it's just for this idea of this that we eat out of season and these these are asparagus that were grown in ireland and are obviously they're not oversized or anything like that they're actually just grown and they're they're <laughs> irish grown hence the homegrown and they're kind of celebrated in this vitrine and they're kind of wrapped and delicately put in on top of this uh, beautiful handmade felt blanket and then they're kind of wrapped together in a twine and celebrated in this in this vitrine um so yeah and it's kind of like it's 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 again to reference that idea that we you know in south america they clear indigenous kind of crops there and forests destroying their their own kind of vital ecosystems and you know washing away their kind of fundamental resources in, in order to, for, to to forcibly grow cash crops which is asparagus you know 12 months of all around season all around the year to supply the european and, and north american markets for the desire to eat out of season so again that's kind of you know that's that refers to the kind of idea that or signal that kind of that contradiction and refers to you know what michael Lee higgins describes as multi multilateral systems and climate change moving so much faster than the efforts we have in ascending to address it so that's that's where where that work home to the show so just i think i'll slide a bit there 
just to look at another recent work that I had made recently was uh, this is work called Hafasa Slement, which was a durational cast iron performance work, which I made at the University of Minnesota in 2019, which was developed for about a year beforehand and involves the um, casting of a, a chair or a throne piece, uh, which is made in reference to the Greek god Hephaestus. Hephaestus was the Greek god of artistry and blacksmithing and craftspeople. He was the illegitimate love child from a secret affair of his mother and father, Greek gods Zeus and Hera. He was abandoned at birth because he was said to be have a deformed leg and he was imperfect, so he was thrown away and lived under the sea with the sea gods or sea nymphs or something, uh, which who trained him to be a phenomenal blacksmith and craftsman and jewelry maker and he later went on to make weapons and shields and objects and automata for other Greek gods like Perseus and people like that or demigods so I say and he later returned to Mount Olympus presenting his mother Zeus 700 years later with a golden throne that she was able to sit in but once she sat in it she was silenced so this was a great gave great consternation to the gods and it's a really interesting retelling. So we we cast out we we performed this piece of work by putting this throne together while it was still hot, and then we eventually covered it and we're asking people to sit sit on the throne. It was also there was also a score delivered, and uh, there was a response given by the audience. So it was kind of very much a, a collaborative kind of audience interactive event at this this iron conference. So this is some type of work that's kind of really interesting me. Um, uh, looking into particularly using the technologies, but also looking to have kind of performance works where there's, where there's audience involvement and multiple participants. And this follows very much on from my own iron project. Yes, sorry, follows on um, from my own uh, this iron project, which I started in 2012 and ran again in 2014 and in 2018. And it's something well, at, at every stage of this project, I always involved a performance event. And for me now, it's something that where my own work is leading, where I want to kind of utilize the kind of infrastructure that I've built over the last few years to uh, um, make performance works. Um, I recently got some funding gratefully from Cork County Council to pursue this. And I'm so I'm currently building a new furnace, which I've been testing. And also looking at, I'm looking at researching the early works of Benito uh, Cellini, the, the Italian Renaissance sculptor, uh, who is had a very colourful and had a very colourful and characterful life, and is, is fascinating to read on a kind of a narrative sense. Uh, it's also fascinating in terms of a technical sense, and particularly I was looking or studying the work, um, his work, um, you know, Perseus holding the head of Medusa, which is the one piece one piece bronze casting in Florence. So that's something that I was kind of thinking about and also just the, the, the whole feasibility of all that. So yeah, that's where my work is going right now. Again, an image of the test of our sculpture, our furnace cooling down. So I think I'll just turn on my camera there and hand back to Chris and just say thank you. So thank you everyone. Yeah, just say thank you again. I just left up some references there. Um, just to say thank you to um, Chris Clark and Fiona Carney again for having me in the show and having me come talk today. And I just want to say a big thanks to all the team at Glucks, particularly Mark Flynn, who was fabulous to work with and help uh, install my work and did such a beautiful job of it and all the team. And thanks for all the support. And uh, yeah, I'll hand you back to Chris for the Q&A. Thanks very much. Okay, welcome back. And I'm gonna welcome James, there you are. Hey, Chris. Hi, thanks very much for that. That was a, that was a fantastic, uh, insightful uh, kind of uh, uh, look through your practice and some previous projects and uh, the, the work that we have on the Glucksman. So um, many, many thanks for, for putting all the time into a, into a great presentation. Um, Thank you, thanks Chris, thanks for having me. And um, so uh, just um, I have a few questions here for you myself, as always, um, and just to tell uh, people in our audience that, um, of course, if you have any questions, pose them in the Q&A or the chat function, and I'm happy to relay them to James. But I'm going to monopolize your time for a little bit first um, while we have it. Um, and first, I just want to ask you a little bit about 
uh, this notion of authenticity, uh, which you alluded to in relation to Rosalind Krauss, uh, and the idea of the original as being kind of the unseen mold rather than you know the finished product itself. And I wonder if you could maybe elaborate a little bit on this idea and its relation to the unseen aspects of your own practice, and particularly in search of the piece that you're showing in the Glucksman, uh, or one of two pieces, uh, in search of authenticity, no good deed goes unpunished. Is the turning away of that kind of surface to show the kind of back of the canvas, do you see this as a way of maybe demystifying the authentic artwork by prioritizing the process and the support structure? Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, in essence, Chris, yes, exactly. Uh, I mean, and I, and I think I suppose it's an ever changing kind of thing when we consider the notion of the authentic. And I suppose, look, it goes back to this, this, this kind of hangover, I think a anybody like me has, if you spend a lot of time working in industry, and I said, if you work in production, and I suppose it goes for everything like in theater or, or whatever, or any kind of large, large scale, even things within film and digital material, materiality and stuff like that but but I suppose what I kind of found out I suppose what's a shock to all of us is when you kind of first discover when you see that I don't know Rodan Pinker or whatever that little one is and you you come across it in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and then and then you come across another one in a gallery down the road and then another one in another city and another one. and I suppose that that notion of that that you know that's that's not the original one or that's not the one you read about in a book and I suppose when I came to work in AB in the kind of 90s and that, I, I was really kind of knocked out by that notion of, of production. But also one of the things I want to talk about in relation to my work and the reason I made that piece was that there is, inherent, as, as you go, as you, the reason I embarked on the intense production was that anytime you do something like that in a mold or a series of molds is that the idiosyncrasies start to happen. I speak about, a lot about this within, when I teach these processes is that the idiosyncrasies happen within the mold and within the castings. And, and we even saw that when you were installing that, I don't know, like bits were falling off and, you know, it, it, they're, never, talk about this. <laughs> they're never going to be, you know, they're never going to be exact. And that's the kind of idea. So it's you either kind of run with that. And I know a lot of my friends and artists who I work with, they go, oh, no, I can't, I've got to do that one again because it's different than that one or whatever. But I kind of embrace this idea of just not flaking through them and, and not caring, but I'm just saying that, they, some were bending, some, some had furls, some had idiosyncrasies, some I would work back, some I wouldn't. So yeah, it's, it's, I, I suppose it's in engaging in highlighting the process, which is, is, is exposing the manufacturer in the work. And, and I suppose that, that the reverse of the canvas is, is, is turning that objecthood around. You know, that, that's what that's about, I mean, as I mentioned. But yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's interesting because I've actually, since then I've started to make some sand and cement versions and I've, I've started making wax ones so that I may end up making a bronze one at some point but it's like the mold has kind of had it now it's kind of had enough and it's 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 been destroyed it's since destroyed it so it's it, yeah it has a lifespan but for it, you know, how long you know. Well it's kind of built in there through the repetition of it as well when you kind of pull all these you know reverse sides of the canvases together and you can see that laid out in front of you so you have this kind of serial work of course but it of course the, you really take note then of the distinctions and the kind of uh, the irregularities I think between them as well so it kind of becomes built into the display as well that that process is always going to be a perfect one even if a lot of times we don't uh, necessarily acknowledge that. And I suppose I was really kind of interested lately as well in, in the use of plaster I've kind of returned so I hadn't made any kind of works in plaster for a long time and, and I suppose that has the, one of the reasons I kind of really kind of liked it was that it has this kind of classical whitey ghosty type of look that you know is this it kind of I started making them I was thinking I, I'm really kind of into the it's soft it's as well it's soft and it has a fragility as we know <laughs> in it and there's something about that because it is although it's a it's a it's a resistant material it has it has that fragility that I like so when we if you go you know down into the corporate gallery and we look at the plaster rooms or we go and look at the plaster rooms and, and this is very much a driving force for this work is because I, I went to London and somewhere I always go, it's like one of our pilgrimages where we all have place we go, but I always end up in the plaster rooms in the VA, VNA all the time. And, and they've been closed for a long time. But I remember going there quite recently, just before COVID and all, and, all, and finding and just looking at certain things in plaster that, you know, there's a, there's a gate to hell there in plaster and things. Like that. And it's just, it's just looking at that. I just, I, there's something about it that it has that kind of classical feel, which I, I like to, I, I like to kind of reintroduce into a contemporary piece, you know? 
I mean, just staying on that particular piece, can I ask you a little bit about the title? You spoke, I think, I thought you spoke very eloquently about uh, about your father and, and how the work kind of uh, touches on this kind of uh, personal and biographical, but also around kind of ideas of kind of nostalgia and national identity. But um, and particularly, I guess, you know, the in search of authenticity, no good deed goes unpunished. Is that something you're happy to kind of uh, maybe speak about a little bit? Yeah, about naturally, naturally, the authenticity notion refers to, to the factor, the manufacturer of, of that multiple, and which is which is the original, you know, and I have the original or whatever, you know, but it's like, it, the, 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 the notion that no good deed goes unpunished, I think it's what I mean by that there is that that relates to the idea of that, I suppose, when you think, when you think of a certain thing that you remember it of or as a nostalgia, it's almost like remembering trips to the seaside when you were a kid or whatever, and then you go back to that seaside when you're an adult and you find that, you know, that the, there is the kind of, uh, what's the word, the inauthenticity of that is very much a nostalgia thing. So it's what I mean by the no good deed goes unpunished is that there's, I suppose there's nothing true in a return, in a, in a looking back, there's no good from a looking back. That's, that's what I, I, I mean by that. And that's and it's a saying that I've always kind of had stuck with, and it's something that I think about all the time. My friends give out to me all the time because just sitting repeating it to them all the time. But it's it's really it relates to that idea of you know was it really what you thought it was? If you do go back, or should you go back, or don't look back? You know, so I think it's all of those things. That's where the title comes from. And um, I have a couple of questions here as well from the audience, including one from John Cunningham, who is uh, mm. your old mate, listening from Melbourne and head of the Melbourne's Public Art Program. He says he's really interested in how you apply your thinking regarding studio practice and how you apply this to a non-gallery space, i.e. the public realm. He also says he loves work, buddy. So I'll pass it on. <laughs> well, it, it's just, I can't express how wonderful it is to hear from John Cunningham. It's been a long time. Myself and John are very old friends. and good buddies um, and I'm, I'm sure I'm going to catch up with him after this and he's so good to tune in from Melbourne my god that's amazing I know it's the middle of the night there um, well yeah I mean as John probably knows I mean and you know Chris I kind of have a, I, I have a public art kind of manufacturing side to my practice as well and it's something you know that when you work in a, in a public art sphere um, the notion of compromise and the notion of, of trying to reconsider work and you know, you, you're usually sat with a brief to try and respond to a certain thematic area or, or something or some historical thing or it's just something it's 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 a very difficult kind of uh, position for people we've seen you know all, all the people we know like you know Alex and all other guys we know that embark on, on working in the public art sphere it's very different to responding to a gallery sphere but the way I kind of to answer John's question is that I apply my thinking to really what 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 suits I mean in particular within the home show I knew immediately when I saw that call that I, I was going to put forward that work because it, it not, not, not only did it fit the theme, but it's fitted the scale and it fitted the, the notion of scale. And, I, and as John probably knows, I'm always fascinated by the notion of scale. I mean, I can work on very small things and to refine it and hold them. And like my ball of string sculpture, it, it's, it's, very much, it's very much a piece of work that, although it's very small, but has a huge, uh, has a huge presence due to its intensity. So my thinking for a gallery of gallery workings is, is is around like for for the moment I'm, I'm kind of working on these performance pieces and building the, i'm building this infrastructure which is taking me years and i'm using it with other artists to, to assist them to make their work and to facilitate the need for this equipment so i don't know where in the sense that my work is going to fit into the gallery into the gallery setting soon but it will you know it'll depend it will depend on the production of 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 the, the, this this these new performances and how, whether I see them as film works eventually, or whether I see them, there's detritus left from the performance work, because I feel that that's where, I feel there's such a kind of a performance in, in casting, in the ritualistic nature of it, uh, the jeopardy of it. <laughs> and I really want to try and get that into the gallery sphere. So that's, that's where I'm at at the moment, John, I'm not sure if that answers your question, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think, um... It certainly touches on some of these ideas of, I guess, you know, the, the sense of kind of revelation or kind of demystification as well when you kind of perform these things as well. That it's like this is what it entails. This is what uh, actually happens here. And of course, it has all those elements of risk. And it kind of t it connects nicely to another question we have here from uh, Rachel Fallon, which is, uh, what importance or role does material experimentation have within your process? Is the perfect pour your ideal, or what place does the unexpected outcome have? 
Yeah, I think, look, I, I think Rachel is something that fascinates Rachel as well. And I, and I think we, we have actually talked about this, I suppose, over the time. And I suppose if I'm to be really hand on heart honest here, uh, I think my, um, the, my importance has changed uh, and my sense of materiality has changed and it has over the last number of years. And it's, it, this is down to both with working within an educational aspect and obviously looking at the, like it's like this idea that I talked about this idea about when I, those pieces that I left the runners and risers on, I mean, there's nothing essentially new in that. And, and what we see happening is anytime I, I teach somebody something like this, or I show some an, an iron pour or a bronze pour or something, they all, when, always, when we take their work out of the mold, they say, and I say, well, look, we'll cut this off and we'll weld this up and we'll do this or whatever. And they go, no, 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 no. I want to leave that on. And that's, it's almost like everybody's kind of first response. It's almost like when you roll a print and, and you, you peel back the, 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 the blankets and you, 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 it's never the print you imagined. And you're always fascinated by that sense of jeopardy or that outcome. So for me, think things have really changed. I'm much more about the kind of content uh, of, of the of the work now. I mean, and I spend a lot of times. I mentioned there in my talk. Um, I didn't talk about public art, obviously, but I did talk about going to the US and working with the international cast iron movement. And I learned so much from them, and they were so supportive of me growing my own project. But what I felt, what I was always a conflict with them because of what I felt there was that. I was more ideological in my thinking and they were more material in thinking that they was just like, it's just, we're doing it because we can. And I was like, well, why are you doing it? Why are you making it? And there was like, because well, we can. And I was like, well, you know, did you think about it a little bit more? Like, what, what does this work mean? So I do think now I'm very much about the meaning of the work and I am always drawn and I just find, I don't know if this answers Rachel's question, but I'm always drawn to that sense of materiality. And that's why I love the iron so much. Um, it has this certain sense of democracy to it. It doesn't, it's not like bronze. It's not as polished or shiny. It's not as loved. It's not as wanted, <laughs> you know? And I just, I like that about it. It has that humility. It has that, you know, and it rusts and it's nasty. And so I think I'm still, I'm still treading that road on, on what I, you know, the, the material quality. Um, you kind of led me back to something that I, I wanted you to maybe mention in the, uh, in the presentation, but you mentioned in the gallery when we, we met there at the kind of outside of the show, and this is about the piece at uh, Homegrown. And I'm going to maybe kind of put you a little bit on the spot here to just relay this, because I think it's absolutely fascinating and kind of shows the complexity of your thinking around material, um, but also about kind of concept as well. And this is the, the, the fact that you talk about the chemical reaction that asparagus will have after you eat it in your urine and how this related to processes of oxidization. Can I get you to maybe kind of just repeat this for people? Because I yeah, yeah, well, I mean, like some, some people know that uh, as a piece I made uh, back in, oh God, it was nearly 10 years ago, 2012, but when I, I made the original, when I grew those asparagus, made the original, um, or, you know, got those asparagus, um, I, was, I was really fascinated by the, that that I that it's called the aphylactic element that when you eat asparagus and it only happens in some people it's a genetic process that your liver just gets rid of the toxins that are within there so I developed a piece that was the genesis of that piece was that I I kept the urine I I I got that asparagus actually my father had grown it and uh, I had at um I, I kept the urine and then I spoke to uh, at UCC and the great Mick O'Shea and we decided we wanted to make a perfume out of the, uh, of the, of the urine. So we kind of removed, we, we distilled it, removed the bacteria. And then as I was kind of doing more kind of research on that idea and we were looking at the, element, the, the chemical makeup of that, it, it was just the, what is the wonderful crossover, which was the fact that they were the same kind of sulfites and the same kind of, you know, ammonia's compounds that are that are very similar that we use in industry to color bronzes and iron things so when we distilled the perfume i made a machine and a drill of asparagus in the gallery and actually did it in the west cork art center um, where it sprayed a drill of, of those cast bronze asparagus and over the duration of the show the ammonias within them turned the the asparagus green so it, I, I love that thing. And at that time, it's very much the same. I've just bottled it in that dream there, not literally, but I bottled the essence of that idea because it's about kind of waste. It's about that idea that your, your body, you know, gets rid of that waste. But I just find that notion that we just, we import these plain loads of, of asparagus from South America and they're stripping these, their hills to grow this 20, 20 uh, 12 months a year, you know, year round. 
So, I mean, I, I, I love that idea that, and so I had this kind of farm kind of piece, which was automated. So we went to the gallery, kind of sprayed the, sprayed the pieces and I made some iron pieces and it, it rusted them naturally. It just rusted them as well. It just made them turn red and the, the bronze ones turned green, which I just thought was kind of profound. <laughs> yeah, it's absolutely fascinating, but also kind of shows the kind of, yeah, the levels of kind of meaning and thought that can kind of go into some of these pieces as they kind of develop and and you maybe this comes a little bit about kind of an interest in kind of you know process and material but also on the idea of kind of repetition or kind of you know working delving further and further into into a specific work or a body of work um i also wanted to ask you there we have a little bit of time uh, you talked quite well i thought on the on your considerations around the plinth as an object um, yeah when you're talking about the scapegoat works, you know, the way you use shutter ply and packing polystyrene as kind of supports for the sculpture proper, um, but also July 19th using packing blanket, pe packing blanket yes. signings as well. Um, and I wonder about specifically with scapegoat, this just kind of crossed my, my mind as I was watching the, the presentation there, you know, this idea of the abandoned materials or the overlooked materials. Do you find a correlation there with the actual theme of the scapegoat as this kind yeah. of sacrificial lamb, if you will? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, absolutely. Uh, I mean, th that was the thing. And I mean, if anything about that work, and I, I'm reconsidering that work actually at the moment, and if anything, it's, it's actually too clean, you know, it's too clean. And look, I, I for years, lo and loads of people I'm sure that are on here, I, I will know, and loads of sculpture artists, people, crafts, or whoever, uh, it, it, the plinth is a bit of a nightmare, you, you know what I mean? It really is, even when we were talking about putting up the asparagus piece, you know, we, we were, uh, you said, do you have any plinth? And I said, I do, I have loads, but we couldn't have the right one. It has to be the right one. It has to be the right to scale and everything. But the, in, in regard to the scapegoat pieces and the shutter fly pieces, it, it just, it actually needed to be nastier, really. They, 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 they were almost a bit too clean looking, but that the notion of the plinth is a really, really difficult one. It's something that I, I've really battled with and I'm kind of, I know when we were in, in the art college and we come to the end of the year and, and students have made these really kind of interesting funky works out of, I don't know, twisted dyed knitted blankets or something, whatever, with some kind of material or metal or wire or whatever it is. And then we end up putting on a plinth and then it, gen then it immediately goes down to the design center or the craft, you know, and we're like, that, that's, that we're losing all of our conceptual content because of the notion of this kind of clean presentation. So it's something when, when I've used plinths a lot of the time, and I made this piece for Eva years ago, back in 2008 called uh, A Room Full of Domestic Bliss, where I had a series of uh, 16 uh, bronze cast um, uh, fly swats and that they were, uh, they were automated. They had a sound piece, they had an automated sound piece that were playing buzzing on them. Uh, when when you enter the room, but what they needed was they they needed that clean connection. So so the so when I would make a sculpture like that, the plinths were built bespoke for the structure. I mean, there's nothing new in that I know, but I'm just saying it had to be that way to have that finish. So they were threaded from the inside up. And I think when I consider a plinth piece, uh, I, and I, I've lit more lately, I've moved on to making these vitrine objects, and I'm still racking myself because when you saw the scapegoat piece the scapegoat has a big pin on it, which runs through the bottom, through the foam, through the top of the plinth, and it's bolted in several places underneath to give that illusion that it's sitting on this foam. You know, you know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's meant to be, again, that jeopardy or the balance between material and, and then obviously the, the weighty balance as well. That's meant to be at play. You know, it's, it's, it's trick, trickery, I suppose, you know? But I think the important, uh, you know, and uh, I guess one thing we haven't really touched on too much, although I, I, I do notice it's something you often go back to is, is your position um, as a lecturer in sculpture as well. And, you know, these kind of considerations, I think, as a, as a teacher are very important for a kind of a class of students coming out to kind of go, you know, the plinth is part of this, how it's displayed is part of it. Is that going to be consistent with what you're trying to say? You don't just kind of put it there as a as we're going now, this is an artwork, but actually that's something that has to be kind of built into it, you know, through the whole making of the work. Yeah, it does. And we, we have, like I said, we have that kind of issue at the end of the year where people just go doink and there's a scramble around for plinths as, as we know. But so, so we have as a, as a teaching team, we're, we're constantly on the same, well, look, why don't we maybe put it on the floor or is there, is there another way or is there some kind of, you know, is there some alternative? Because they, they do something I mean, and, and, and obviously like we don't have kind of gallery spaces in the sense that we show them within the studio context, even though we, you know, clean it up and make it showtime and everything. But I do think there's that, there, there is that kind of worry 
that it, it goes into the you know shop yeah. you know the, the nice handbag and brown thomas or whatever on this you know thing on this perspex thing and it's how far you push that and like you can in, ter in terms like we, we've done things in times where we've built steel ones and she and i've done that myself like she iron ones but then they then they fall into the realm of possibly becoming too sculptural and it's are, is that connected to the work then or is the work is it sitting on that or is it <laughs> attached or what is it so I, it really is a minefield it's interesting that you brought it up because uh yeah, struggle continues <laughs> Um, James, as you were just about out of time there, but I just want to say a, a warm thanks for, for your generosity today and uh, speaking so eloquently about your practice and to everybody for, for watching and posing questions as well. Um, and that we'll be back here next week uh, with uh, Eileen Hutton next Wednesday. But uh, for now, I just want to say a, a very big thanks to uh, James L. Hayes. Thank you. Thanks, Chris, and thanks everyone for joining. Thanks, John. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I'll talk soon. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Mark.